Velkomin. Velkomin á þessa fyrirlestraröð Háskólans í Reykjavík og vísindafélagsins um gervigreind fyrir almenning. Ég heiti Ólafur Andri og ég ætla að vera fundastjórni stjóri í þessari fyrirlestraröð. Áður en kynni fyrsta fyrirlestraröð þá langar mig að þess að segja af hverju við erum að tala um gervigreind og gervigreind fyrir almenning. Nú er það þannig að gervigreind er allstaðar. Gervigreind er komin við nótum hana daglega en fæst þeir gera sér grein fyrir hvað þetta þýðir, hvað myndi að þýða til dæmis fyrir störfin okkar í framtíðinni þannig að við hvort sem við viljum hvort sem okkur líkar að betur eða vel við þurfum að vita aðeins meira um gervigreind og þá er ég ekki að tala um að við þurfum að vita hvernig á að búa til gervigreind heldur hvað hún þýðir fyrir daglegt líf og störf Nú, tilefni þess að við erum að þessu er líka það að ríkistjórn Íslands samþykkti í fyrra að bjóða þjóðinni á námskeið endurgjaldslaust í gervigreind fyrir almenning og stjórnvöld hafa unni með Háskóla Íslands og Háskólunum í Reykjavík um það að þýða námskeið frá Finnlandi yfir á íslensku með öllum þeim hugtökum og orðum sem að því fylgja íslenskt námskeið fyrir íslenskt fólk og þetta námskeið fer síðan í loftið strax eftir eftir páska. Námskeiði heitir Elements of AI og var þróað af finnsku fyrirtæki og háskólanum í Helsingi og er mjög aðgengilegt og skemmtilegt. Flókin atriði útskýrð á mannamáli fyrir bara venjulegt fólk og þetta er eitthvað sem að fer í loftið strax eftir páska. En við ætlum að vera með þessa fyrirlestra röð og kynna gervigreind fyrir allum og reyna að velja til okkar mjög skemmtilega fyrirlestra og sá fyrsti er hérna mættur. So I'm going to switch to English now because our first guest is Michael Waldridge. He's a professor of computer science and the head of department of computer science at Oxford University. He has been an AI researcher for more than 25 years, and he has published more than 400 scientific articles on the subject. He is a fellow of the Association of uh, Computing Machinery and the Association for Advancement of AI and the European Association for AI. He has received Lovelace Medal for, from the British Computer Society and in, in 2020, and he received Outstanding Educators Award from AAAI in 2021. From 2014-16, he was the president of the European Association for AI, and from 2015-17, to 17, he was the president for, of the International Joint Conference of AI. He, has, he is the author of uh, the book The Road to Conscious Machine, a popular science introduction to AI published by Pelican in 2020. And, uh, Michael, I actually bought this book yesterday. I'm looking forward to reading that. So, uh, And... Uh, the lecture uh, is going to be called Artificial and Intelligence, Fact and Fiction. So, Michael, uh, welcome to Reykjavik University, and uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. So, let me share my screen, and we can begin. So, hopefully you should all see my screen. Um, so, um, my talk, as, as, uh, as Olaf has suggested, is, uh, is distinguishing uh, the, the truth from the hype and the fantasy of artificial intelligence. And so why are we all here today? We are here today because artificial intelligence is big news, right? We hear about artificial intelligence in the press uh, and on social media on a kind of daily basis. Uh, and there's a lot of there's a lot of news. There's a lot of fake news about artificial intelligence. And so what I hope is that after this talk, that what you'll be able to do is to when you hear these stories, that you'll be able to apply what you've learned today in my talk and and distinguish between the hype and the reality, the fact and the fiction of artificial intelligence. Well, some people think AI is very very big news indeed. So uh, here's a quote that goes back about five years from Andrew Ng. Andrew Ng. He's an extremely distinguished. AI researcher. He was head of the AI laboratory at Stanford University, one of the world's great centers for artificial intelligence. He then went on to uh, head research at, at Baidu in China, which is a very, very large Chinese uh, uh, tech company. Uh, he was one of the founders of Coursera, which is one of the open education platforms, very big in artificial intelligence. So he should know what he's talking about. And he thinks AI is going to be bigger than electricity, right? Well, electricity is pretty big, I think, as far as I'm 
I'm concerned. But some people think AI is even bigger. So uh, here is a quote from Sundar Pichai. Uh, I've misspelled his name, unfortunately. His apologies, Sundar. Uh, he says AI is bigger than fire and electricity. Fire, right? Fire is the most fundamental technology that humanity has. And he thinks AI is bigger than that, right? Well, that again, that's pretty big news. But some people think AI is even bigger than that. So according to Anthony Lewandowski, um, AI is God. So what is this all about? Well, uh, he founded a religion, the religion of artificial intelligence. And the, uh, the precept of that religion was uh, AI is eventually going to take over. So let's start worshipping it now. OK, so that sounds a bit crazy. It is, it is a bit crazy. Uh, if you want to understand what he was all about there, you have to understand that in the United States, uh, religions get tax breaks. So follow the money is always good advice when you're trying to understand uh, things like this. Well, whatever the truth of all of those, AI is very, very big news. And uh, it's also a very appealing story. And we all know something about artificial intelligence. We all have some ideas, some preconceptions about, uh, about what AI is. And the most common preconception about what AI is uh, relates to what's sometimes called uh, what's well, sometimes called general AI. So I'm going to call this the Hollywood version of AI. So general AI, the Hollywood version of AI, this is to do with machines that are conscious, machines that are self-aware and sentient. Uh, the idea of the singularity, what is the singularity? If you know anything about AI, you've been studying AI over the last few years, you'll have heard this expression. The singularity, this is a great story, um, the singularity is the point at which machines become smarter than people, right? That's the singularity. Singularity. And the idea is once we reach the singularity, then after that, machines will be able to apply their superhuman intelligence to making themselves even smarter. They will be able to make themselves smarter. And then those smarter machines will be able to make themselves even smarter than that. And the idea is that then this, this process is out of human control. Isn't that exciting? I think it's exciting. Um, uh, super intelligence, a phrase that we hear very often in the context of, uh, of artificial intelligence. The idea we hear about machines that are super intelligent, that they can do something super intelligent, they can do something far better than any human being could. So this is the Hollywood dream. And it makes for great movies. It makes for great books, uh, makes for great video games. Um, and the singularity, you know, keeps people awake at night. Right. The idea that somehow AI might be out of our control, super intelligent machines might be out of our control. The reality, though, is that that is not where the action is in artificial intelligence. The AI has made huge progress over the last 15 years, and I'll talk about what that progress is and, and why that progress happened. So AI has made very real progress, but it has not made progress on the Hollywood dream. So general AI, as far as I'm concerned, is something which for the moment is very firmly in the movies and in science fiction and in video games. There is no sign of conscious machines. There is no sign of the singularity. There is certainly is sign of super intelligence, but only in very, very narrow, specific tasks. So let me talk about that idea. So where is, if AI is not concerned with this general AI, the idea of um, having machines, what general AI is about is having machines which have the full range of intellectual capabilities that human beings have. So if AI is not about that, then what is it about? Well, what we do in AI is sometimes called narrow AI. It's about getting to machines to do things, very specific tasks, very narrow. That's why it's called narrow AI, very narrow, very specific tasks that people can do, but machines at the moment can't. Right. Um, so what are examples of those? Well, an example would be, for example, uh, recognizing a face in a picture. A very simple task, right? But recognizing a face is actually an incredibly useful thing. So if we have reliable face recognition, then in the future, we probably won't need locks, for example, because your door will just recognize you, excuse me, as you approach and unlock itself, right? Um, uh, uh, um, every time you upload a picture to social media and the social media uh, uh, identifies you in the picture that you've uploaded, 
it's doing narrow AI. Behind the scenes, there is some artificial intelligence, some uh, facial recognition software, which is AI software, which has done that. What are other examples of narrow AI? Game playing programs, right? Uh, uh, there are computer programs today that can effectively beat any human being, more or less, at a game of chess or Go or any number of other uh, board games or, or, and, and an increasingly wide range of, of computer games. But these are narrow tasks. Uh, a more complex, but still nevertheless narrow task is automated translation, right? Being able to translate from, uh, from English to French and from French to Icelandic. Um, and we have software that can do that pretty reliably, not perfectly. And I'll come back and talk about why it's not perfect in a moment. Um, uh, but nevertheless, these are very, very, very narrow tasks. So there's been lots of progress recently on narrow AI, but narrow AI is very different to the Hollywood dream. So my advice is when you're understanding what AI is and where it's going for the foreseeable future, forget about that general AI uh, dream. OK, um, so. To understand uh, what AI is about and the kinds of things that we, uh, the kinds of narrow tasks that we want computers to do, it it's helpful to look at some things which are easy for computers and some things which are hard. So what I've done on this slide is I've given you some examples, starting at the top with things that are very easy to get computers to do, right down to the bottom uh, with the hardest things that to get computers to do. So we start at the top with arithmetic. You know, this is addition, multiplication. So when you were at school and some of you may well still be at school, you know, in, in, you will have been taught how to do arithmetic. And in some cases, if you're doing long division, it's tedious. But nevertheless, there is a formula that you can follow. There's a recipe that your teacher teaches you. And if you just follow that recipe, you'll be able to do multiplication and addition and division. And because there is a recipe, that's basically what a computer program is. It's just a computer program. What computer programmers write to get computers to do things are just lists of instructions. And the instructions that your teacher gave you can easily be translated into a computer program. And so arithmetic was one of the first things that computers did. Um, so that was trivial to get computers to do that because those recipes could just be directly written down as computer programs. But then we move on to things like playing a board game. Well, playing a board game, a game like chess or checkers or more complicated game like Go, there is a, actually, there is in principle, a very simple recipe to do that. What does that recipe look like? A very simple formula for playing those games. And the formula is look at all the alternatives. You're playing a game on a game of chess. Just look at all the possible moves that you can make. And then for each of those moves, all the counter moves that your opponent could make. And then for all of their counter moves, how you could respond to that. And you just carry on that process. And you'll be able to identify with that process, that exhaustive process, looking at all the alternatives, you'll be able to identify the winning positions. If I make this move, then no matter how they respond, I'll be able to make a move which will lead me to a winning position. Now, it's actually a very simple recipe and it's easy to write as a computer program, but it doesn't work in practice. And it doesn't work in practice because it requires hopelessly too much computer time or memory. Right? To play chess like that would be utterly impossible because we'd be waiting millions of years uh, for the for the computer to come back with the with with the best answer, it just isn't practical. So there, the weird thing is, we have a recipe like the recipes for arithmetic and so on, which works in principle, but doesn't doesn't remotely work in practice. And so there, we need something else. And if there's something else that we need is AI. Um, another example, recognizing faces in a picture. Um, so I've already mentioned this. Uh, why is this difficult for computers? Well, here it's difficult because we have no idea what the recipe would be. It's not like arithmetic where you can write down the rules, write down the formula for recognizing a face in a picture. We have no idea what that recipe looks like. So again, we need something else. What do we need? We need AI. And I'll show you how that works later on in this talk. Then we move on into some interesting things, which are interesting because if we look at driving cars, we don't think of this as being requiring intelligence, right? It just requires a bit of common sense. And, you know, the, that's about it, really. But here's so I, let me ask you a question. What do you think? is so difficult about getting computers to drive cars. People have been trying to do this for decades and decades and decades. It's a very long standing dream and we still aren't there. We're close, we're not sure how close we are. It's within decades probably, but it could potentially be even longer before we get computers to be able to do this reliably. 
What do you think is difficult about driving a car for a computer? So you might be you might be tempted to say, well, it's about knowing all the rules of the road, you know, and how to steer the car. No, that stuff is all easy, right, for a computer because we can just give the rules of the road. We can write down the recipe uh, for for the rules of the road. That part's the easy part. The difficult thing about for a driverless car is understanding where it is and what is around it. Understanding that that thing in front of it is a bicycle. Understanding that that's an obstacle. Understanding that that is a speed sign. It's stuff that we take for granted. It's called perception. It's understanding what's around you in an, if in in its environment. If you could solve that problem for driverless cars, which would enable a driverless car to know where it is and exactly what is around it, that that's a cyclist, that's a stop sign, that's a speed sign or whatever, right? You would have essentially solved the driverless car challenge. And that's where all the difficult things about driverless cars are. And we then move into ideas like interpreting spoken language, so automatically transcribing what somebody says, reliably translating from one language to another. Um, so we have technology now which pretty much does all of those things. We are close. We aren't quite there yet. Then we move on to some ideas that are, we're much further away from, understanding a story and answering questions about it, inventing funny jokes. There's actually a lot of research on, on getting computers to write jokes, but at the moment, to tell you the truth, they're not really very funny jokes. Um, then uh, interpreting what's going on in a picture. We'll come back and talk about this later on, uh, writing interesting stories. We have no clue about those things. Why do we have no clue how to get computers to do those things? Because we don't know what that recipe would look like. It's not like arithmetic where, you know, you're taught how to do that in high school. There isn't a recipe for writing an interesting story. There just isn't. Okay, so that's some things that we might get computers to do, ordered from easy down to very hard. And the really interesting ones, I think, are these playing board games and recognizing faces in a picture. We have a simple recipe to play board games, but it doesn't work in practice because it requires hopelessly too much computer time and too much computer processing power. We don't have any clue about what a recipe might look like for recognizing faces in pictures. And problems of those two types are very, very common in artificial intelligence. Okay, so in general, if we want to, sort of, you know, th what are computers bad at? What do we, um, and therefore, what are the things that we focus on in artificial intelligence? Problems to do with perception. This is the driverless car problem. To do with vision, uh, interpreting, uh, uh, interpreting uh, what's around you in your environment, interpreting speech, and so on. All the problems to do with perception are difficult for computers. Dealing with poorly defined problems. Uh, if we have a very, very specific problem, we can very often come up with a very specific recipe for it, right? Um, but if the problem is very poorly defined, we just don't know what that recipe would look like. Long-term reasoning, I'll come back and talk about this uh, in a while. This is where the consequences of what you're doing now lie a long, term, uh, a long time into the future. And finally, things that require judgment as opposed to precise rules. So in, in our everyday lives, we're, we're, we make judgment calls all the time. So we're told that taxes are good for us because they enable us to build hospitals and schools and so on. But we're also told that taxes are bad for us. We make sense of that, right? We somehow navigate a path through that. But for a computer, where well, you've got conflicting stories like that, conflicting evidence, it's very, very difficult. So whenever you're looking at a problem for a computer and you see those things arising, those are a big signal to you. This is gonna be difficult for a computer. This is, this is we're now in the domain of artificial intelligence. Okay, so I've already said this, basically, why are the hard things hard? The first possibility is that we have a recipe to do it, but it just requires too much computer time or too much memory. And this is an example is playing board game. And the other possibility is actually, we just don't have a recipe at all. We haven't got a clue how to get the computer to do this. And an awful lot of AI basically focuses on those two types of problems. And the second category of problem, possibility two, where we just don't know what that recipe would look like, um, problems to do with perception are very, very, very central to those that, that class of problems. So how do we do it? How do AI researchers try to build programs that can do this stuff? 
And there are basically two approaches in artificial intelligence. And the history of AI is about all of these two approaches. Basically, pretty much everything that's happened in AI can be categorized as one of these two processes. So the first process is what you do is if you want an artificial intelligence system to do something, translate from one language to another, recognizing a face in a picture, then the idea is what you do is you go to somebody that's good at that, human being that's good at that, and you find out what the expertise is that they use when they try to solve that problem. How does a human expert do that problem? We find out how a human expert does it, and we give that expertise to a machine. And so it's top down because you're finding out all of that expertise and dumping it on the machine. And the hope is if you've extracted all that expertise from a human that the machine will be able to do it as well. The second possibility is what's called bottom up. Uh, and this is where instead of trying to explicitly get all that human expertise, what you do instead is you just show the machine what you want it to do. You demonstrate to the machine and you train the machine uh, to what you want to do. And this is an area called machine learning or deep learning. And this is the area that's really had uh, a lot of progress over the last 15 years. And I'll talk about what that progress looks like um, in a moment. So those are the two basic approaches. All of AI boils down to really those two approaches. You either find out how a human expert does it and you extract from them all their human expertise and you, you write that down in a form that the machine can use. You give that all to a machine. Or alternatively, you use techniques where you train the machine. You show it what you want to do. OK. Um, the most famous or possibly infamous uh, experiment in the sort of the top down uh, 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 worldview was something called the Psych system, Psych spelled C-Y-C. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, 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 the founder of the psych system, the developer of the psych system was a very influential, a brilliant AI researcher called Doug Leonard. And his view was that actually the Hollywood dream of AI, general AI, was a problem of, of knowledge that if you could give a machine enough knowledge, the knowledge that a human being has, then eventually it would have general intelligence. But here's the thing, to make it work, what Leonard said, is that you would need to give the machine the complete sum of knowledge that a typical human being has about their world. All of the knowledge that they have about their world, that they use every day to navigate their world, to do whatever it is in, in their world, would have to be explicitly written down and given to a machine. So absolutely everything that you know about your world. So, for example, red taps produce hot water. I presume it's the same in Iceland, but they certainly, well, occasionally they produce hot water in the United Kingdom. Uh, the sky is blue. You can't eat Kansas. Cats are often pets, but not always. Every single piece of knowledge, every single common sense piece of knowledge about the world that a human being uses as they go about their, their day to day work would have to be explicitly written down uh, and, uh, and given to a machine. Well, it didn't work. And it's interesting to look at why it didn't work. It didn't work because actually they, they weren't able to systematically extract all of that knowledge. We don't even know an awful lot of the knowledge that we make use of. It's completely, you know, we learned it when we were children about how to, you know, an awful lot of the things about our world. And we don't explicitly know them in our mind. So if you ask a, a human being, what do you know about our world? They can't articulate it. So it didn't begin to work. And it's often cited as an evidence as evidence that this top down approach, you extract the expertise from a human being and you give it to the machine. It's often cited as evidence that that doesn't work. So the alternative then is to show the machine what you want it to do. Um, and technically, I mean, I, this is not a very technical talk. This is about as technical as it gets. What the idea is, what, you're, what you want the machine to do is you want it to learn a mapping from inputs to outputs. So on the right hand side of the slide, I've got some examples. What we've got is uh, a, 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 an example that I've already talked about, facial recognition. What we want the program to do is to learn how to recognize faces. 
And the way that you train the program is you show it lots of pictures of people and the input is the picture. And uh, if you're a student of computing, you'll immediately recognize that this is Alan Turing, very influential British uh, computer science researcher, one of the founders of computing. And on the right hand side is the output we want to produce. When you see this picture, this is the output that I would want you to produce, the text Alan Turing, the, the name Alan Turing. So underneath that, there's a picture of Alan Turing as a child. And again, I want you to produce the output Alan Turing when you see a picture that looks like that. And you train the program by giving it lots and lots and lots of these examples. And in the end, the goal is that if you've trained it right, um, that when you show it a picture, including Alan Turing, it will produce the desired output, which is just the text Alan Turing, the name Alan Turing. So that doesn't say anything, though, about how we do the training. So how do we do the training? There are many different ways that we could do it. But one approach which is particularly successful at the moment, which is uh, where all of the uh, excitement is about AI this century, is an approach called neural networks. So neural networks, what are neural networks? Neural networks take their inspiration from the microstructure of the brain in the nervous system. And if you look at the brain or the nervous system under, under a microscope, a high powered microscope, you'll see that there are massive numbers of very, very highly interconnected nerve cells called neurons. And they're highly interconnected. They're arranged in massive, massive networks with billions of these neurons, uh, with many of them, with many neurons connected into many other, uh, many other neurons. And what these neurons are, are very, very simple information processing units. They can do tiny, simple computational tasks, extremely simple computational tasks. But when they're arranged into very, very large networks, they can produce uh, the richness of human intelligence, uh, human general intelligence. So more specifically, here is a very, very abstract view of what a neural network looks like. I mean, this is way too simple to do anything remotely interesting in a practical case to do anything interesting with a neural network, you'd need thousands, millions, or potentially billions of, of, of neurons. But on the left-hand side in the slide, you see these input neurons. This is called the input layer to the neural network. So think about these inputs as being like the pixels, the little colored dots that make up a picture. And you've got one of these input neurons for each of the colored dots on the picture. So if you're looking at your screen now, it's made up of millions of tiny little colored dots, which nowadays are too small for you to, to really see individually. But that's how the, the, the picture is broken down. So imagine that there's one input for each of those little colored dots. And then in the middle, in the blue kind of purpley color in the middle, we've got some neurons that are looking at those inputs. So this is called the hidden layer because it's between the inputs and the outputs. Um, and each of these neurons in this middle layer is receiving inputs from the input layer. And it's looking at those inputs. And if it sees a particular pattern on those inputs, just a very, very simple pattern, it produces an output. We say it's excited and it produces an output. And what that means is that that output then feeds into the next layer in the neural network. So there's only one layer in this, this neural network, but in principle, we could have many, many, many possible networks. Um, so um, the idea is that, um, when you train a neural network, what you do is you show it those pictures, which just means for each of those inputs, you give it the associated colored dots for a particular picture, and you show it the required output that's producing the text Alan Turing. And in principle, there could be many different outputs there, uh, with one of them being Alan Turing. And what you do in the training process is you just adjust. Technically, what you do is you adjust the, those neurons in the middle, what's called the weights on those neurons. So the idea is that each of those inputs going from the input layer to the neurons in the middle has attached to it a weight or a significance. And this uh, a particular neuron will fire on the middle layer if it sees inputs so that, that correspond to certain weights. And then the training part is finding the right weights. And that way, that's where all the maths and all the difficulty is uh, in, in machine learning. But hopefully you can see the basic idea now of how a neural network could recognize things. It is seeing these inputs and these, these neurons in the middle, when they see a particular pattern, they are producing an output which is feeding into the next layer of the neural network. And the neurons on that layer are looking for, for different patterns. And when they see different patterns, they produce an output to the next layer and so on, until finally you reach the final layer in the neural 
neural network where you are producing an output. And if you've done your training right, then uh, what's going to happen is when it's shown the picture of Turing, it produces the text Alan Turing on the right hand side. So neural networks are a very old idea. Actually, they're nearly a century old. They were originally talked about in the 1940s by, by two American researchers, McCulloch and Pitts. Um, but for a long time, it, it didn't work. Uh, all of the difficulty in neural networks is, is doing the training part, which is finding those weights. Remember, each neuron is looking at some inputs which have got different weights, different significances attached to them. Um, and so all of the, the hard mathematics and all of the hard computer science goes into the training process to try and find those weights. So if you're shown a picture of Turing, you produce the right text as output. But it's taken off this century. And why has it taken off this century? Well, there was some, there have been some scientific breakthroughs. What's called deep learning is, is something which is only 15 years old. And the deep part of deep learning really originates this century. But actually, just as important, it turns out that to be able to train these neural networks, you need lots and lots of data. You need lots and lots of data, lots of pictures of Alan Turing, lots and lots of pictures of Alan Turing and other people to be able to train the program. If you just show it a picture of Alan Turing and nobody else, it will just always produce the text Alan Turing when you train it. So you need lots and lots of training data. But we are in the age of training data. And every time you upload a picture of yourself and your friends to Facebook or Twitter and you helpfully label that picture with your names, what you're doing is you're feeding their machine learning algorithms. You're training their neural network. So you need lots of training data. And also, it turns out to do this training requires lots of computer power, which is now cheap and easily available. So let's see an example of an actual uh, machine learning system. And this is one of the very influential systems over the last uh, 10 years or so. And it was written by DeepMind. DeepMind, a London-based company, now owned a wholly owned subsidiary of uh, Google or Alphabet, more accurately. And it's a single computer program that learned to play a large number of computer video games. In fact, Atari video games from the 1980s, 8-bit video games. So the graphics and so on aren't very sophisticated. So here's the thing. When I'm, go I'm going to show you a video in a moment. And here is what I want you to bear in mind. The program, the way it learned, is just by playing at random to start out with. It had exactly the same controls that a human being would have. In fact, a joystick and a single fire button on that joystick, that's it. And the only input that it saw was the screen, exactly the same screen that you or I see. In, their, in the case of the program, it was broken down into these pixels, these colored dots. And the only other thing it saw was the score, the current score of the game. So it starts out by playing randomly, but then when it does something good, when it gets a score, it's, it, it's training realizes that it did something good. The training program realizes that it did something good. And it basically, the, the algorithms behind it say, right, the next time I'm in a similar situation, I'm going to do the same thing again. And it just repeats that process, just playing and playing and playing. When I do something good, I'm going to do the same kind of thing again. And it just repeats that process and it learns how to play. So let's see the video. So this is, you'll, I think uh, the game players amongst you will immediately recognize this very ancient game. This is one of the earliest video games called Breakout. And you control the paddle at the, the bottom. And the goal is that you have to use your paddle to control your panel to knock out all the bricks in this, this, this wall. And as you can see, the scores at the top, every time you knock out a brick, you get a point. Now, when you knock out a brick, when it knocks out a brick, it's learning. It's discovering that it did something good. So it's making it more likely to do that again in a similar situation. So now after 400 training episodes, it's not missing the ball at all, right? It's consistently hitting that ball back. It's never missing it after 400. It's learned that. But then something weird happened. After 600 training episodes, something remarkable happened. It discovered an incredibly efficient way to get a score in the game of breakout bounces it drills a hole through the wall and the ball bounces across the top and that's the most efficient way to get a score now this is an ancient video game this is a 40 year old 45 year old video game the designers of this program had no idea that it was going to give learn that and they did not give that behavior to it right remember the top down approach you would talk to an expert game player find out how they did it and then give all that expertise to the program with atari's uh, with the with the DeepMind game player, it just learned to do this on its own, starting from the beginning, which basically just doesn't know what it's doing, except when it happens to hit the ball 
and it then gets a score as it did there. I did something good. So in the same circumstances, I'm more likely to do that thing again. So this was a huge achievement. It was a huge achievement because nobody told it how to play. Just by essentially starting out by playing at random, it learned how to play. And there were 49 of these games, and I think 30 of them, if I recall correctly, it learned to play at or better than a human being could play. Um, and this is really important because the only inputs it got were the screen and the current score and the controls were just the, the joystick with the fire button. It did have one other advantage, though, which is it knew what the score was. So why is that an advantage? Well, do you know what the score in life is? Right. I mean, do you know moment by moment how well you are doing on any given day? You know, are you getting immediate feedback on the actions, the things that you're doing? Are you immediately discovering whether you did something good or not. That's actually quite a big advantage for the program, which we don't have in the real world. But it was a hugely impressive achievement because the sensory input it got, there were no tricks. It just saw the same screen that we did and nobody told it what game it was playing. It just had to learn the games. And one program learned to play all of those games. So that's very impressive. But actually, there were some games that it did very badly on. And one of them was called Montezuma's Revenge. It got a score of zero on Montezuma's Revenge. And it's interesting to look at why that is. On the game of Breakout, when you get a point, you get that point immediately. And you immediately see that what you just did earned you a point. There's instant feedback on that. In the game of Montezuma's Revenge, it's kind of a weird game. You have to do these long chains of weird tasks before you get any points. And the program just couldn't learn the association between these long, weird chains of things that it had to do and getting a score at the end of that. Right? It just couldn't learn that. So this is long term reasoning. And the way I always explain this, it's like I don't know if people in Iceland smoke anymore, like real cigarettes. Right. But, uh, you know, I briefly did when I was a young person. But certainly some people still do smoke in the world. But we all know this is bad for us. So why do we still do it? Exactly the same reason. You're not going to get feedback on that action in the form of ill health and so on until decades after you smoke those cigarettes. If you got that feedback immediately, I think it's a safe bet that you would have learned much earlier that smoking was a bad thing to do. And in exactly the same way, uh, the computer program couldn't learn that. Um, so let's look at some other things that are tough at the moment for these machine learning algorithms. Here is a literary example. So uh, if we were together in a room, I'd ask whether somebody could recognize this text, but I won't. Obviously, I'm not in a position to do that. Um, the, so this is the first paragraph of a very famous French novel, probably the most famous French novel of all time. Um, uh, this is A la recherche du temps perdu um, uh, by Proust early 20th century novel. I don't read French. I'm sure there's many people on this talk now that could uh, that could read it with a much more elegant, uh, uh, a much more elegant accent than mine. But it's the first paragraph of this uh, of this novel. Uh, and so here is and I talk, I was taught French for about 10 years and I can pick out the odd phrase, but nothing more than that. So here is the first paragraph translated by a professional human translator. For a long time, I used to go to bed early. Sometimes when I put out my candle, my eyes would close so quickly, I'd not even time to say I'm going to sleep. And half an hour later, the thought that it was time to go to sleep would awaken me. I'd try to, wait, to put away the book, which I imagined was still in my hands, and to blow out the light. I'd been thinking all the time while I was asleep of what I'd just been reading, but my thoughts had run into a channel of their own until I myself actually seemed to have become the subject of my book. A church, a quartet, the rivalry between... Uh, Francois I and Charles V. So that's the first paragraph translated by Proust. Well, how does Google Translate do? State of the art automated translation system. So it's not bad, actually. I mean, it's, uh, and actually, since I did this, it's got a lot better. I think they actually gave it the Proust, the formal translation. But um, this is what a machine learning program learned to translate. The way that this translation happened was by showing their translation program lots of examples of French text, English text, French text, English text, French text, English text, until it learns the associations between the French text and the English text. When it's shown this French text, the neural network produces this output as being the most probable translation of it. But actually, if you look at this translation, actually it doesn't make a lot of sense. You can see the same kind of words, 
but actually as a, a you know a, a child would a, a native english speaking child would be able to see um this uh uh, uh that this is not a very good translation half an hour later the thought that it was time to go to sleep would awaken me i wanted to ask the volume that i thought i had in my hands and blow my light it's nonsense right from english you can see the same words from the 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 the, the professional translation but it's kind of been jumbled up and nonsensical the translator didn't understand what they were doing. There is no understanding of what's going on. All that's happening is that neural network is looking at, these are the English words, it's been trained by showing it lots of these things, it's just producing, the neural network on, is, on the output is just producing the likeliest translation. It's not doing a statistical calculation here, but it's producing the likeliest translation of that. It's not saying, what did Proust mean by this, right? It's not doing the kind of things that a human translator would do. There is no mind behind this translation as there was in the English translator. And actually, if you think about it, to be able to translate Proust well, actually isn't even enough to be an expert in French and English. You know, have to know a bit about Proust. You have to know a bit about early 20th century France. For example, the fact that uh, blowing out your light is because they used candles in early 20th century France for illumination and so on. You would need all of that background knowledge. Google Translate doesn't have that. It's just the neural network, which is looking at this input. It's been trained on lots of examples of English text, French text, sorry, French text, English text, and it's producing the likeliest translation. Um, another example, um, and this is really just to show um, what we use in the human world. So explain the following dialogue. This is due to Steven Pinker, the, French psych uh, the American psychologist. Bob says, I'm leaving you. And Anne says, who is she? So that's a six word dialogue, but it's incredibly rich. I mean, it's dripping with meaning, that six word dialogue. All of us immediately on hearing that dialogue, we've got a picture in our minds of what's going on. Bob and Anna are in a relationship. Bob has clearly uh, uh, started to be unfaithful to Anne or is speculating that because he's found somebody else. Anne believes that that's what's happened and she wants to know who the other party is that Bob's being unfaithful with and so on. We've all got this incredibly rich picture in our minds. Where do we get that from? We get that from the human world. We get that from our day-to-day -day experiences. I'm 54 years old and I've been learning how to interpret that dialogue for 54 years in the human world. Google Translate doesn't have anything like that. You can translate those six words from French, from English to French, from French to Spanish, Spanish to Icelandic, Icelandic to Arabic and Arabic back to English and you would get the same six words back. Right. And in that sense, Google Translate, for example, is doing something very, very impressive. But at no point is there any understanding in the way that we all had of what's going on in that dialogue. Now, let me put it to you. If we're going to build AI systems that inhabit our world, that we interact with in our environment, they're going to need to be able to know about the human world. They're going to need to be able to know, for example, when they do something which is going to irritate somebody or make somebody angry. And as I say, I've been learning all that stuff for 54 years, uh, just as all, every listener to this talk and every viewer of this talk has been learning about the human world. How do we give that understanding to machines? We have no clue. Uh, OK, I'll skip over that example. Let's see, move on to this one. I don't know if Doctor Who, the TV program, is big in, uh, in, in Iceland. Olaf, I'm looking at you. Is, is Doctor Who a thing in Iceland, the BBC TV show? Just... Uh, yeah, it, it, it has been shown on Icelandic okay, TV. Good, it's, good. I'm so not sure someone, if it's big. <laughs> okay. Uh, so this is uh, this uh, this is a uh, this is a character on the right hand side in the picture from uh, the BBC TV show Doctor Who, and this is a science fiction show about a time traveller who travels around time and space. And behind him, the blue box uh, behind him uh, is a uh, is his time travelling machine. Okay, so I've told you that. So the character on the right is called Matt Smith. He's the actor that plays Doctor Who in this program. So Alafa, I'm going to put you on the spot again. So I've told you that this is uh, uh, this is a picture of Matt Smith, uh, the actor. So what has he got in his pocket? What has Matt got in his pocket? Uh, I'm not sure. He, he's an actor. So what do you think it would be? He has a script. Okay. What's he got in his hand? What's he holding? Uh, a cup. Of okay. Coffee, well, probably what's in the cup. Yeah. Coffee, it, it, perhaps. Coffee, or in England, more likely tea. Tea, right? Uh, okay. So, um, are they filming when this particular shot was taken? Probably not. 
Probably not. So what do you think is going on in the picture then? Uh, I think the uh, I think both of them played uh, Doctor Who. <laughs> okay, as it happens, no, that's not the case. In fact, okay. this is my, my late grandfather-in-law oh, okay, uh, okay. who happened to walk onto the set and got to take a selfie with uh, with the actor Matt Smith. He's phenomenally nice, apparently. Okay, one last question, Olafa. Uh, what is around them? What kind of things? So they're filming. What is going on around them? What kind of things would you expect to see around them? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, they have the TARDIS there, I think. <laughs> yeah. But there's going to be cameras, there's going to be lights, there's going to be lots of Absolutely. people. Yeah, all of that stuff. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, you looked at the picture and with a few clues, you immediately picked up on what was going on. You immediately got that it was a script, that he was holding a cup of tea and so on. So you were immediately able to interpret that. So let's see what an automated interpretation program makes of it. So uh, you, there are many programs that do this kind of thing on the internet now, and you can upload pictures and they will come up with captions for them. And so this is what uh, Microsoft's caption bot does. It says that, I think it's Matt Smith posing for a picture. Okay, um, so on the one hand, this is doing something very good, right? It's recognizing Matt Smith. What does that mean? It means it's been shown lots of pictures of Matt Smith, which have been labeled with the text Matt Smith. And all this program is doing is basically what I showed you earlier with the pictures of Alan Turing. You know, given a picture of a human being, produce the right text to go with that but it's not able to do any of the interpretation that we just did. For example, Matt Smith is an actor and we used that fact. We immediately concluded that thing in his pocket is a script. He's probably holding a cup of tea, which means he's probably not filming because he's on a tea break and so on. So this is showing you the gulf between just being able to recognize a face in a picture and understanding what's going on. There is no understanding there whatsoever in that picture. So just because I'm really cruel, but they, they, Michael, but the, 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 the AI found out that they were happy. <laughs> it did. So it was able to do something. It recognized smiling pictures, it's smiling faces. That's very good. But that's a long way from understanding what's going on in the picture. Maybe a component of understanding, but it's a long, long way from understanding. I mean, it didn't get from the fact that Matt Smith was an actor to that thing in the pocket being that it was a script. It's a very, very natural deduction. Everybody I've ever asked that question to got it in the same way that you did, right? They immediately got that that was a, that was a script. Okay, so then let's move on to something really, really hard. What's going on in the following picture? Okay, so you immediately recognize the picture. It's one of the most famous paintings of all time, Van Gogh's Starry Night. And just because I'm very cruel, I uploaded it to Mac CaptionBot. And this, so this is not what CaptionBot is for. And colleagues in Microsoft, it's a beautiful system. So please don't, um, uh, please don't feel offended. But here's the thing, it didn't even know it wasn't looking at a photograph. It says, I'm not confident. I think it's a couple of animals that are in the water. Its neural network is looking at that picture and just the likeliest output that it comes up with is a couple of animals in the water. So to be fair, it knows that it isn't confident, but it doesn't even recognize that it's not looking at a photograph of a, an actual scene. So what I'm trying to illustrate for you is the limitations of current AI and machine learning techniques in particular. Um, let me give you one last thing which is missing. So in the picture on the right hand side here, imagine you're driving down the road and you see this as it happens, it's a fire truck, but just imagine it's a truck which is on fire uh, in front of you. So what do you do? Well, you're not gonna just drive past this and ignore it. But here's the thing, for a driverless car, this is just an obstacle. It doesn't know that it's a, a vehicle on fire and that when you come across a vehicle on fire, you should keep your distance and call the emergency services. It's just an obstacle and it's just gonna drive around it. So common sense understanding of the world is missing. Right? When you train driverless cars, and that's exactly what companies like uh, Waymo uh, and uh, Five AI and so on, what, that's exactly what they're doing at the moment. They are showing them lots and lots and lots of road scenes. But whenever they encounter, whenever the driverless car encounters a scenario that it hasn't seen before, it doesn't have human common sense understanding of the world, which we've had, in my case, built up over the 54 years of my life to be able to draw upon and to decide what to do. It just sees an obstacle. When it sees an obstacle, it drives around it. So any out of the box thinking is beyond simple AI. 
Okay, so what I hope to have illustrated to you is that contemporary AI is on the one hand exciting, right? Facial recognition, automated translation. That automated translation program, it couldn't translate Proust very well, but it will certainly get you around your holiday in Thailand or, 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 or China or France, right? It's good enough to be able to translate a menu or, or the air conditioning instructions in, in your bedroom. So it's very, very limited. But I hope to have demonstrated it's a long way from the kind of the Hollywood dream of, uh, of AI. So what are the kind of things that you might want to think about, the concerns that you might want to think about? And they, these may be addressed in other uh, elements of AI uh, programs. Issues like lethal autonomous weapons. Should we give a drone the capability to decide whether to take a life? A, 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 a lethal autonomous weapon that is a, 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 an aircraft uh, which is not controlled by any human being, but which can fly around some, some territory in a war zone and decide whether to kill somebody. Is that ethically acceptable? Most people think not, but actually it raises some quite profound and challenging issues. Unemployment and inequality. If machines are superhuman in many, many different, uh, different, different tasks, aren't they going to put human beings out of a, out of a job? Issues like privacy, if machines are better at recognizing faces in pictures and we've got cameras and we certainly do in the UK, CCTV cameras all over our environment, you know, that raises quite profound issues to do with privacy. Fake news and altered reality. Um, we're now seeing computer programs, AI programs that can produce news stories, which just look very plausible, even though they're completely fake. And if your news stream is full up with far, far, far more false news stories than true news stories, uh, what are we going to do about that? Algorithmic alienation. What if AI is your boss? What if AI is monitoring everything that you do throughout your working day and it's kind of critiquing your emails? That email you sent, Olaf, sir, the, uh, uh, Olaf, uh, the other day, you know, it was rather rude, I thought. You need to be a bit politer when you sent that, that email to me. You know, that, that kind of thing, right? That, getting that kind of feedback from a computer program, a computer program making judgments about whether you get a pay rise or even whether you stay in a job. That's called algorithmic alienation, right? Um, and it's profoundly worrying. Algorithmic bias. If we, I talked about training AI programs, but if the, the data that we use to train these AI programs is biased, for example, has inherent sexism or racism embedded within it, then the computer program is going to learn to be biased. Um, and, uh, 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 and as connected to that, if, if AI is just being built by white male college educated individuals, then the AI that they build is going to reflect their, their mindset. So these are things that you should all lose sleep about. What I think you shouldn't lose sleep about is the Hollywood dream right now. I think the idea that you see these kind of um, Skynet intelligence explosions, the kind of the version of, of, of AI from the Terminator movies, I think that's extremely unlikely. And as I hope to have demonstrated, the current advances are very, very, very narrow. And you can't add those current advances together to get general AI. We have no idea how to put those together to get general AI. And I think if it happens, and it's a big if, if we get to the, the Hollywood dream, we're going to see it coming a long way off. I don't think it's going to take us by surprise. But let me just close with a video which is now a couple of years old, but not very many years old. And this is the state of the art of US military robotics in 2015. This is a competition organized by, um, by DARPA, um, the US um, Military Research Funding Agency in 2015. And it's a dexterity competition. So it's for dexterous robots. And they're given challenging tasks like opening a door. So that's an entirely real video of a robot whose task was to do nothing more than open the door. And it failed dismally at that task. So if you are still worried about the robot apocalypse, um, then my advice to you is close the door. Uh, you don't need to lock the door, by the way, just close it, right? And, uh, and you'll be safe, I think, for, uh, for some time to come. OK, so I'm about done. Um, uh, the, the, Olaf, I mentioned uh, books I've written. Uh, here are the pictures of a couple of books I've written. They cover very much the territory that, that I'm describing here, the history of AI and the different approaches to AI and what worked and what didn't work and what's successful now. So I hope you enjoyed your talk and I hope you learned something from it. Um, I am done, so I will stop sharing my screen.
Thank you for this, Michael. Excellent talk. Um, we have a couple of minutes for questions. Um, and uh, uh, I guess uh, the robotic op apocalypse is, is not coming soon. Well, if, if they learn how to open doors, uh, well, you can, also, you can paint the doorknob in the same color as the door, and that will fool them for a few <laughs> years. But uh, uh, Andrew Ng said the AI is the new electricity. I was actually, he probably said it all, uh, many times, but I was actually in the room when he, he said it at one time. So uh, it was quite something. <laughs> but uh, I, I have a couple of questions uh, that I want to sure. ask you. Now, if you look at the history of AI, um, it's kind of a depressing history because uh, high hopes and then disappointments and uh, you have winters and, and booms. We are now currently in deep learning boom. Um, do you think that it will continue or do you think there's a dead end around the corner? No, oh, I think we. I think it will continue. I think apart from anything else, because we, we do have these techniques, these deep learning techniques, these neural network techniques that have been shown to work on many tasks. And I think what we're seeing now is people just looking everywhere to see where can I apply these techniques? And they're finding lots and lots of ways in which they can apply those techniques. So I think it will continue. What will be interesting, though, is, as we talked about earlier, this is a very old idea. And it was big in the 1980s, but kind of died out. And it's interesting to look at why it died out in the 80s. It wasn't that the fundamental science was wrong. It was because computers at the time just weren't powerful enough. And it just hit the limits of what computers could do. You just couldn't train big enough neural networks to do anything interesting is the truth. Remember, these neural networks have many of these tiny little neurons. Um, and in the 1980s, you were training neural networks with like 100 different neurons. And by comparison, there's about 100 billion neurons in, in the human brain. Um, so what I'm curious about is whether we will see something similar happen. That is whether we will hit the limits of uh, of, of what computers can do, because they are getting more capable year on year, but they're not getting that much more capable. So we may well see a kind of a flattening out of, of these capabilities. But I think we're going to see a lot more exciting developments yet. We're not done yet. I mean, we've got, I think, another decade or so of exciting developments at least. Yeah. One, one issue that you mentioned was that you need lots of training data. And uh, one of the challenges that uh, we have in Iceland is that we don't have that much data because we're a small nation. Even if, you, if you're going to teach uh, computers to learn Icelandic, uh, uh, the, the language is just so not, uh, we don't have the, the data for it. What, so what, 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 what can you do then? Uh, well, it's interesting you raise that. I mean, um, so... I never really understood before deep learning why people were so obsessed about data. But if you look at the success stories in deep learning, they absolutely are as much connected with having good data sets, good training data sets. And um, it turns out that you can have quite straightforward machine learning. You don't need you don't need the brainiest AI machine learning scientists in the world if you've got good data. So it is worth, what I'm saying is it's worth investing in getting the good data. Actually, that is just as crucial. You don't need super advanced AI if you have that good training data. So for example, if the, 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 the Icelandic government is thinking of investing in AI, you know, my advice is also invest in data because it's, you know, it is worth putting money into getting those, those, those data sets because once you have them, everybody can use them. You can reuse them. You can use them time and time again for many, many different, uh, many different challenges. So that I think it's worth investment in data specifically. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Uh, uh, how important do you think that uh, for companies, you mentioned like DeepMind, uh, for companies to fund academic research in AI, how, how, how important do you think that is going forward? Um, so I think that's incredibly important. I mean, so one thing we've noticed, I, I mean, I'm curious whether you've, whether you've noticed it in Iceland, but um, companies knock on the doors of AI and machine learning researchers an awful lot um, to say, look, come and work for us. We'll give you an, we'll give you an incredible package, you know, compared to a, a typical university uh, sort of package. And it's a challenge for us to maintain what we do when, you know, when our, when our, when our best people are offered these incredible packages. But um, the, uh, the, the upside of it is that um, 
you know what we the other thing we do apart from research is is we we train students we educate students and so we are the pipeline for those companies and so there is a very strong interest from companies in maintaining that pipeline because there's no there's no value in in having students who've never been educated in these things because the people weren't there to do it um so certainly in the case of deepmind they've been very generous to us and i know a number of other universities in in investing in that pipeline and i think exactly because they recognize the importance of it yeah exactly um so one last question when will we get gen- artificial general intelligence so i am a skeptic i'm not expecting it i'm i would i'm really not expecting it any time in my lifetime um uh, i think there are it's it, i mean it gets very hard to predict what's going to happen beyond a couple of years in the future um but the truth is i think at the moment we have some of the ingredients but actually we don't have the whole recipe or anything like it it isn't the case i think that just more powerful computers are going to get us there um so that we are missing we not only do we not have a recipe there are some ingredients that we don't even know what they are that are going to go on to that recipe so i yeah. think we're a long way off but yeah. um uh my sense is that um and some colleagues to be fair some colleagues disagree with me about this but my feeling is that we will get plenty of notice before we get there yeah exactly um so i think we're out of time uh and again michael i want to thank you very much for being with us here today in the, this first lecture in this uh, series that we are offering at Reykjavik University Uh, þá er þessu lokið hjá okkur og ég ætla að þakka öllum sem að horfðu á þennan fyrirlestur hjá Michael og uh, við erum búin. Takk.